Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me, as usual, is my good friend and co-host, Scott Hemingway. Say hello, Scott. What's happening, everybody? That's a great question. It is. What it is. is happening? Things and stuff. Things and stuff. Yes. Yes. Not at the same time, different times, but things and stuff. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're just two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some Dark Poutine. Jump, jump, jump. <laughs> Oh my goodness, it's episode 65. Hmm. They just keep go- going one right? digit higher every week. A digit high, like it's like, here's the next one, yeah. and then the next one after that is typically a number higher. Anyway, um, before we start, we want to thank our loyal listener, Catherine Buchanan, who's attended both our Victoria BC meetups. She did the research and the bulk of the writing on this episode, which is actually quite nice. That's, oh, that's the awesome. first time that's happened. Thank you, Catherine. And she is really good people. I've made some edits here and there and added more information in other places. Thank you so much, Catherine. Yeah, thank you. It's really, having met her, it's really cool to be able to have her participate in such a way she has. Yeah. 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 And she really wanted to do this for us. So. Yeah. And it turned out really well. Beautiful. In the late evening of May 17, 1981, two shots rang out in a quiet neighborhood across the street from the legislative buildings in Regina, Saskatchewan. One bullet shattered the sliding patio door and hit Joanne Wilson in the shoulder as she was washing the supper dishes. She was lucky this time and survived the attack. She would not be so lucky next time. This is the story of the murder of Joanne Wilson, the ex-wife of Colin Thatcher, three-term MLA and son of the ninth premier of Saskatchewan. So for our American friends, a premier would be, I guess, like a governor. It would be like the governor of a state. Yeah. And an MLA would be just like your state representative would be an MLA. So a member of the Legislative Assembly. MLA. MLA. Joanne K. Giger was born on August 21st, 1939 in Osage, Iowa. Oh, I didn't know she was American. In 1944, the family moved to the idyllic town of Ames, Iowa, where she grew up. Hmm. Or it might be Osage, but I'm not entirely sure. I'll just say Osage. Sure. Because that's that's kind of the way it looks. I like the sound of it. She was the second of four children to parents Harlan and Betty. Joanne has been described as very feminine and fussy about her clothes and hair. Hmm. She was busy in school joining clubs and then getting a part-time job when she turned 16. She loved to buy clothes and loved making her own money. I've been also described as feminine and fussy. There's there's nothing wrong with that. Nope. No, I embrace it. She displayed her talent for decorating while working in the linen and drapery department of a store called Yonkers in Mm. Ames, where her boss allowed her to order materials, set up displays, and advise customers on appropriate curtains or bedspreads for their homes. Oh, okay. This planted the seed for her future passion for decorating. Her mother, Betty Giger, 
said that some of her fondest memories were of the two of them poring over interior decorating magazines until 3 a.m., dreaming of how they would decorate their homes. And that's from A Canadian Tragedy by Maggie Siggins. That actually sounds like a really great memory. Like, that's a... Well, mm. That would be something that you would look back on later in life and cherish. For sure. When Joanne finished high school, she decided to attend Iowa State University and enrolled in the Home Economics Program. It was a four-year degree program which many young women back in 1957 enrolled in. Most of them used the program to learn about homemaking, and Catherine wrote here, a sign of the times. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. In the book A Canadian Tragedy by Maggie Siggins, Joanne is described as being a good student, uh, but more importantly, she was very social. Mm. She was outgoing and loved people and her circle of friends. She was strong, resolute, two qualities that would make her struggles with Colin so fierce and prolonged. Mm. She would not give up even when afraid. Siggins also writes that after Joanne moved to Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, she made a wide circle of women friends from all walks of life. Many of these women would go on to support her over many years of battles with Colin Thatcher. Colin Thatcher was the son of Ross Thatcher, the ninth Premier of Saskatchewan. Born on August 25, 1938, he was the only child of Ross and Peggy. Reports and stories from friends and neighbors reveal Ross to be a particularly cruel and unloving father, fond of insulting his son for any minor reason. For example, while riding in a car with Ross's secretary when Colin was a small boy, he says, Dad, look at those bulls. And Ross replies, those aren't bulls, they're cows, you nitwit. Jeez. Nitwit. No, yeah, nothing will like, take the wind out of your sails and your father belittling you. Calling you a nit. Yeah. People who knew the family said that Colin could never please his father and that much of the arrogance and bluster that Colin was so good at displaying in his adult years was a result of deep-rooted insecurities. Yeah, I know. That makes sense. Mother Peggy was shy and reserved and not demonstrative in showing love to Colin. After Ross was elected MP in 1945 when Colin was only seven years old, he was away in Ottawa much of the time. So his dad was elected a member of parliament. Mm-hmm. Peggy often accompanied her husband, leaving Colin in the care of the housekeeper at the family home in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Colin told Joanne that he was desperately lonely during those 11 and a half years that his father was an MP. Yeah, I can imagine. As Ross Thatcher grew into an imposing, wealthy, and powerful political leader and businessman, his status influenced Colin and led Colin to believe his family was special and Above the Law. Oh, no. And from the book titled Not Above the Law by Heather Bird, <laughs> Ross would yell and scream at Colin in front of everybody, intimidating and humiliating Colin. He was also verbally abusive to Colin's mother, Peggy. And I guess the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Yeah, you know, we see this so many times. Yeah. So many times. It's... uh. It, we we definitely do tend to emulate our environments. And when you're young and easily influenced, you're, you're absorbing that shit. Yeah. Colin went to work on his father's farm after graduating Iowa State with a Bachelor of Science and Master's of Science degrees in agriculture. Hmm. When Ross Thatcher died in 1971, Colin Thatcher wanted to pick up where his father had left off and got into politics himself. In 1975, Colin Thatcher became MLA for his first time winning the riding of Thunder Creek as a liberal. He crossed the aisle to the Progressive Conservative Party two years later when the polls were favoring the PCs to win the next election. Yep. The liberals were pissed off with him for clearly a self-centered move. Yeah, only two years he was with the liberals, is that right? Uh, well, he was probably a liberal from 1971. To... But, an, but an MLA for them for two years. That's so correct, yeah. I can, yeah, I can see why they'd be frustrated. Colin had met Joanne at Iowa State. Joanne introduced Colin to her family on Easter weekend of 1960, announcing she was pinned. I gotcha. Yeah, like a commitment thing. Yeah. Not engaged, but engaged to be engaged. Yeah. Yeah, a pre-engagement. The Geekers later recalled that there was nothing memorable about this first meeting, saying that Colin was quiet, well-groomed, pleasant, and quite handsome. Okay. Betty said that when they came to Regina for Joanne's funeral, she saw a picture of Colin on television and was shocked. She said... In the book, A Canadian Tragedy, he had developed that terrible scowl, and he's known for that scowl. There were mixed reviews from Joanne's friends about Colin. They ranged from comments like, I never understood what she saw in him at all, to a guy we considered a playboy 
who talked about his father's money to mm. he was exotic. That was the thing. Tough looking, but sexy. Interesting. Exotic. I don't know why he'd be described as whatever. Joanne had confided to a friend that Colin was the first man she could not wrap around her little finger. Oh, interesting. Okay. So he was a challenge to her, I guess. But often that only makes somebody try harder. Exactly. Yeah. Joanne met Colin's parents in August of the same year. They established a warm and loving relationship. Ross told a friend that he could not believe his son snagged such an accomplished, pretty young woman. The Geegers and the Thatchers became fast friends after the engagement. Many years later, Peggy sided with her son during the bitter marriage breakdown. Yeah, well, as indicated there and earlier, the father really is not a supportive uh, guy or or kind or loving uh, individual for sure. Colin rented an apartment in Ames close to the Giger's family home. He would cut their grass, take Joanne's little sister Nancy for ice cream, and be devoted to Joanne. Harlan once told Betty about their future son-in-law, I sure hope they stay in love because if they ever fall out, he could kill her. Yeesh. Yeesh. (laughs) They also said that from the time they drove away after the wedding, Colin never came back until after Joe had left him and came looking for her. That's um, a lot of foresight there by the father-in-law. Well, you know, the older guy can probably see the cut of this guy's... uh, Yeah, very, very perceptive. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Wow, though, wow. Jeez. It's like, well, is, is any guy ever going to be good enough for your girls, right? Yeah, th- but that, from that to, I think you'll kill her. Yeah. It is. Uh, yeah, that's a bit of a stretch. It's a, well, it's a bit of a jump. Colin and Joanne were together for 17 years. The first few years, Joanne taught home economics, a job she detested, and Colin worked on his father's ranch, which had grown to a huge spread by now. Colin and Ross butted heads over pretty much everything with Ross continuing to call his son stupid, an ass, a jerk, not caring who was in earshot. Wow, what a dick. According to Maggie Siggins' book, the confrontations between father and son became the stuff of legends in Saskatchewan. Oh, wow. One story goes that Colin was so enraged with his father that he went out and castrated one of Ross's prized bulls. Jeez! (laughs) This may be a myth, as one rancher put it. There's not too many bulls who would have stood there and let him cut off their private parts. (laughs) But this shows the magnitude of the problem. Yeah, the fact that people are creating uh, myths, uh, myths around. since that there is the the proverbial is, smoke when there, where there's smoke there's fire. There's yeah, a, there this is, is how much these two actually hated each other. Yes, yeah. yes. Joanne gave birth to their first child, Gregory Ross Thatcher, on June 26, 1965. Possibly, Ross felt guilty about his bad relationship with Colin as Greg was the apple of his grandfather's eye and spoiled by both Ross and Peggy. That probably pissed off Colin even more. I would imagine so. It was probably not lost on Colin that Greg was on the receiving end of love Colin craved as a small child. Yep. uh, And throughout his father's life, which he never got. Yep, totally. Joanne had two unsuccessful pregnancies after Greg, and it was not until February 19th, 1969, that son Reagan Colin was born. The last child was Stephanie Ann, born on January 7, 1974. Everyone said that Stephanie was the most like her mother. Aww. Colin would describe theirs as an excellent marriage for 16 to 16 and a half of those 17 years. Joanne would not describe things the same way. Yeah, I was, gonna, I was just going to say that. I, th- I think that's his perspective on it. They were happy the first year, but after that, she began to realize that she'd married a tyrannical man who would brook no argument from his wife or children a man with a volatile temper, a man who was emotionally unstable. So a really upstanding chap. Paying the bills, but he's just a jerk to be around. Yep. Joanne catered to her husband, as she was trained to do, and sometimes used her father-in-law to help her get what she wanted. Swimming pool in the backyard, for example, after Colin refused. (laughs) Which, Colin was probably pissed off at that again, too. Yeah. Because, you know, here's Ross building this pool for his wife after he said no. Yep. It, this weird control As you're going to say, takes the control forth. right away from him and yep. you drive him crazy. Especially if you're a narcissist. Yes. She never really stood up to him when he barked orders or lost his temper when others were around. I feel badly for Joanne. Yeah, absolutely. Their kitchen cupboards became marred over the years from Colin hurling dinner plate full of food at them, not caring if the children were around or not. That reminds me of American Beauty. Remember that? I do, yeah. When Kevin Spacey just fires the asparagus at the wall. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Joanne locked herself in the bathroom once when Colin was on a rampage, but he ended up splintering the door to bits. Wow, what a temper. Joanne filed the first affidavit for divorce in 1979. In that document, from Not Above the Law by Heather Bird, she indicates the serious problems started in 1977 when Colin began treating her badly. He'd come home in the wee hours in the morning, and on more than one occasion, he struck her with his fist when she questioned him. Joanne had developed black eyes and wore sunglasses to hide them. Oh, poor Joanne. Colin claimed the black eyes were accidents from him rolling over in bed. Wow. Wow. I mean, I've rolled over in bed and elbowed Carol in the side and stuff like that. Uh, and I'm a tosser and a turner, yeah. but I've never left anybody with a black eye. Well, I mean, it could happen, but... Constantly? But clearly she says it was because he was beating her up. Yeah, yeah. He later changed the story, though. Oh. He said he fell off the ladder and struck Joanne with his elbow. Oh, okay. All right. I fell off the ladder, like about 10 times. Yeah, yeah. And struck her ten times with my elbow. Well, he was determined to get up the ladder. Sure. Yeah. Fair enough. What a brute. Yeah. At one point during the last couple of years, Colin told Joanne, if you don't like it, you know what you can do. Okay. Which do is it. leave. Yeah, do yeah. it. Do it, please, Joanne. Her father, Harlan, said that remark cut her hard in two. Colin was also be a good dad category. Uh, well, I would imagine if he's a uh, terrible person to his wife, that typically is going to trickle down. He was frequently away from home. When he was there, he was cold, distant, and lost his temper with the children to the point they would avoid him as much as possible. He thought nothing of throwing a glass across the room, smashing it, and scaring the kids. Oh, the poor kids, I, I can only imagine being in that kind of an environment where you're constantly... I've only ever seen it at somebody else's place. I didn't live in that, but I actually did get to witness it at somebody else's house, and it was... Uh, it was scary. Uh, yeah, now imagine that being your parent. That's and, your life. And what you're constantly seeing. Yeah. And like th how that would impact you is extreme. And, yeah, that's and, pretty brutal. And we're all human. I'm a parent. There are times when you just feel overwhelmed and don't necessarily behave how you would like to. But it doesn't sound like he's remorseful. It doesn't sound like he's the kind no. of individual who'd be like, I'm so sorry. And, Oops, I, I, yeah, I how, blew up. I'm sorry I blew up. And how can I be a better person? All the kids are getting is throwing glasses and, and belittling and violence. Ugh. On August 12, 1979, Joanne packed up the two youngest kids and made her escape. Greg, the oldest, had grown very close to his dad and was becoming much like Colin. Oh, gee. She was able to get away at that time because Colin was partying with some friends at a condo that he'd purchased years ago in Palm Springs. To say Colin freaked out when he found Joanne was gone is an understatement. What ensued was three and a half years of scandal, legal battles, kidnappings, that's Colin taking the kids when he was not supposed to have Jeez, them, yeah. and violence. Huh. So a normal day for him. He had no intention of letting the children go with their mother. His hatred for Joanne grew. His ego was shattered when his wife rejected him. He convinced himself he was the wrong party, you know? Mm. She'd done him wrong. Yep, exactly. He decided to make things as difficult as possible for the mother of his children. Yeah, you know, instead of just moving on and uh, growing and saying, ah, shit, I guess I should, that was a bit of a, uh, I've got I've to improve who I am. No, no. Just go on attack. He regularly referred to Joanne as the bitch in front of the children. Mm -hmm. During a visit to friends at Christmas 1979, Colin told the friend that there was, quote, from Heather Bird's book, Not Above the Law, only one solution for the bitch. The only solution is that I have to hire someone to kill her, end quote. Holy shit, he said that in front of people. Yes. Holy shit. In front of people. That's just, yeah. Whew. And he said that. Yeah, I, it's <laughs> yeah. It's not the. It isn't. It's not bad enough that he was thinking it. He said that. But you, he you said that. You don't care that people are hearing you say that you're gonna. That you, essentially, you want to hire I, somebody to kill her. Yeah, like oh, wow. Joanne was not without fault. She had an affair with a family friend, Ron Graham. I can see how that would happen yeah. if you're getting beat up and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And this was got, only after Colin had been having affairs and treating her badly for years. He's just going to say that, and then you've got somebody who's you know probably coming in and showering you with some kind words and stuff. Yeah. So. When you're being made to feel like shit every day, yeah. and somebody comes along and doesn't make you feel like that, I can see why somebody would be interested. Yeah, I mean, Colin abused her physically, yeah. emotionally, 
Yeah. You know, she showed strength by leaving him. Yeah, absolutely she did. Joanne met Tony Wilson in the spring of 1980, shortly before the divorce from Colin was finalized, which was later that same year. When it came to the divorce yeah. and the custody battle, Colin fought every ruling not in his favor. Uh -huh. He'd kidnap the kids, send Reagan to the U.S., and then for months refuse to disclose his whereabouts. And so he was charged with contempt of court several times. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Like, again, just using the children as a tool to hurt somebody. That's disgusting. Colin spread lies about Joanne to family and friends. For example, telling everyone she told him he could have custody of the kids for a million dollars or as much money as he could raise. Yeah, I, I doubt she said that. Yeah. During the custody battle years, various strange and sometimes dangerous things happened to Joanne. Oh, God. Here we go. Yeah. One time, after visiting the kids in Moose Jaw and driving back to Regina where she'd lived, the brakes failed on her car. A mechanic checked them out and told her that they'd been tampered with. Hmm. Jeez, I thought that only happened in movies. Nope. Another time, the distributor cap had gone missing, tires were slashed, and sugar was put in her gas tank. Yeah, I mean, this is all not accidental stuff. You don't act, Sugar doesn't accidentally find its way into your gas tank. No, it just doesn't magic itself in no, there. No, no. And somebody's got to have a grudge. Totally. I wonder who. No, oh, if there's only somebody in her life that is uh, If better. only we could figure who yeah. might mm -hmm. have done that. Yeah, I'm going to have to go back to detective school. One other incident was the garage door closing on the barbecue, which could have only been triggered by someone driving by and pushing the remote control that he had in his car, which is Colin. Yeah, I would imagine um, those remotes aren't widely distributed. No, that. so yeah. he still had it. Yeah. Colin had encouraged Reagan to run away from his mother at every opportunity, and he began to behave like his older brother, developing disrespect for his mom. Oh, God. You know, just poison your children I, it, against, the, against their mom. It's driving me crazy. Just because you don't like somebody mm. doesn't mean you need to taint everybody else's perspective. You said taint. I did, and I like saying it. Greg was already living with his dad, having refused to live with his mother as he developed a deep hatred of her, fed by the lies and manipulative tactics that Colin employed to turn the children against their mom. He just needs to win, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. Like, he just... Yeah. Fuck. Again, from Not Above the Law is a statement made by the judge, M.A. McPherson, who is trying to get the custody battle settled. Uh, this kind of sums it up. I know Mr. Thatcher much better now. His methods and purposes have been to destroy his wife in the minds of their children. In so doing, he has gone a long way toward destroying the children themselves. That is well said. Well said, Mr. Yeah. Judge McPherson. Yeah. What, what year was this? Uh, late 70s? Early 80s? Early 80s. Yeah, that's pretty, uh, you, you know, you typically wouldn't hear these things uh, in, in... Well, unless the guy is like a complete bastard, which it sounds like he was. Yeah, but well, we've seen so many situations where, you know, they've been support... Anyways, diatribe. Colin Thatcher won his third straight term as MLA in the 1982 election. The Saskatchewan Tories won a majority government in that election, and Thatcher was appointed to the provincial cabinet as Minister of Energy and Mines. Hmm. But that's not all he was working on. Oh, interesting. What else could he be working on? Colin busied himself with trying to find someone to kill Joanne. Oh! During the divorce and custody battles, there was a long list of people that Colin told he wanted to hire a hitman to get rid of Joanne. My God! Like, for somebody who's had uh, quite a few levels of success in his life, he's not really that smart. Well, th that behavior isn't that smart. If it, it, Well, and multiple times talking about wanting to kill your wife, I think that you, you can still be very, very smart in many areas of life and quite stupid in other areas. And in this area of, of murder, he's very stupid. Yeah. You can't, like, if you have to know if you're asking multiple people, hey, do you want to kill my wife? Like, you're, you're leaving quite the trail. Yeah. It is possible that he, if even one of these people had shared this with police, Joanne might still be alive, but they didn't. Good God. Mike, if you ever ask me to kill somebody, yeah, spoiler alert, I'm telling the police. <laughs> there you go. Not only did he mention it to many friends, he also tried to enlist the services of a neighboring ranch owner. Yeah, jeez. This man, his name was Gary Anderson, uh, after taking payments from Colin but refusing to do the deed himself, supplied Colin with a rifle after Colin asked him to find one. Hmm. 
Colin took Gary to the house where Joanne lived with her new husband, Tony Wilson, several times. <laughs> From the book, Not Above the Law, Anderson said, Colin explained to me how easy it would be to get her. End quote. Yeesh. Anderson still refused to murder Joanne. Eventually, Colin asked Gary to rent a car for him and leave it a few blocks from Joanne's house. Okay. The keys were in the ashtray. My immediate thoughts are, geez, that's not safe at the car. It could get quite stolen quite easily. Well, yeah, yeah. But I I'm guess that, that's it, not really what we're concerned about That's not what they're thinking here. about. No, no. On Sunday, May 17, 1981, at 10.10 10 p.m., Joanne was in the kitchen unloading the dishwasher, and there was the sound of a large crack as a bullet shattered the triple glazed door and smashed into her shoulder. Holy shit. She was rushed to the hospital for surgery and survived this first murder attempt. Wow. Gary Anderson had been instructed to listen to the news, and if he heard anything about Joanne being shot, he was to come get the rental car. Anderson did as he'd been told. Hmm. He took the car to the car wash, cleaned it inside and out before returning it to the dealer. Tony and Joanne had no doubt in their minds as to who was behind this attempt on her life. Oh, yeah. Tony even challenged Colin about it a few weeks later, and Colin never denied it. He even told Tony, after not coming to an agreement on a divorce settlement payment, quote, If that is the position of Joanne, you and Joanne had better take steps to protect yourselves, end quote. And that's from the book Deny, Deny, Deny. Holy shit. So instead of saying, no, 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 it wasn't me. That's crazy. How could you guys think that? Well, if you think that's me, you better start protecting yourself. Wow. Okay. Golly. Yeah. The day after this first attempt on Joanne's life, Colin showed up late for a conservative party caucus meeting. The MLAs had been discussing the incident, but silence came over the room when Colin arrived. Oh, <laughs> you imagine yeah. you hear a pin drop. Oh, yeah. there he is. Colin sat down, and he broke the ice by saying, quote, Well, if I hired a hitman, I guess I don't have to pay him. End quote. Jesus. Like, that's probably in the friggin' notes of the meeting. Oh, it absolutely it would be. It has to be. My shit. His colleagues were clearly stunned. Ye no? Yes. Yes. They. I certainly bet they were stunned. Oh, my goodness. Can you imagine? N uh, yes. Yeah. But no. But no. That's, it's just, yeah. Wow. The tension. Like, I'm curious that, I wonder if they, like, nervously laughed, if they thought it was funny, or if it was just crickets. If tumbleweeds. It's probably bullets. just everybody just looking at each other and trying not to meet, uh, make eye contact with Cuckoo Bird. Tumbleweeds rolling across the caucus floor. The police investigation into this first shooting fizzled out. There was not enough evidence or witnesses, so the Crown did not press charges for this shooting. I guess Anderson could have come forward and told, but he didn't. Yeah, you know, in my head, I mean, immediately, what do you mean evidence? He's, he's told all these people, but none of them came forward. Yeah. So as far as the police are aware at that point. Mm -mm. It did result in Joanne renouncing custody of Reagan and settling for much less money than the courts had ordered. So Colin wins. Yeah, and, and it, it, which is what he's trying to achieve is, yep. is, is victory for him. In January of 1982, Colin went to Palm Springs and purchased a handgun. He also bought 100 rounds of Winchester 38 Special Plus P silver-tipped aluminum jacketed bullets. Wow, okay. These bullets are designed to expand and open up, causing greater trauma and greater blood loss. So they're killers. So they're it's to be used for good? Not at all. Hmm. Colin's lawyer, Tony Merchant, was appointed by Colin to the position of Crown Corporation Counsel. So... Hmm. A little bit of cronyism there, maybe. Mm -hmm. A lot of ah, it. Ah, who knows? Yeah, me. Just give your friend the job. Yeah, because that doesn't happen anywhere. He <laughs> never happens no. any time in government ever. Or or corporate, and nope, just it's all done by the books. Colin was still in a somewhat messy relationship with Lynn Mendel. Uh, her birth name was Dally, a woman he'd been on and off with for about two years. From practically the moment she had met Colin... He had complained about and badmouthed Joanne. <sighs> so here's your new boyfriend, 
who wants to talk about his ex-wife and how awful she is. I mean, I, I, that, goes over every, that goes over well every time. That's great first date yeah, fodder women, right there. Women love that. Men love that. Partners love that. Yeah, let's tell hear me. about the last person who you're still obsessed with. Hey, if you could, tell me nonstop about your ex, please. I would yeah. really, really love that. That would be fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I'll be just over here hanging myself. <laughs> He talked about having her killed or killing her himself many times over the years that they dated. Also great date material. Yeah. For various reasons, she never took him seriously, or if she did, she possibly believed that Joanne was the evil person that Colin made her out to be. And that's what narcissists do. They get you to believe them. Yeah. They paint the, they paint the picture so well that this person has got to be awful. Yeah, and, and, you know, for her, like, not taking them seriously and stuff, I think that's a defense mechanism a lot of people have, because to accept the fact that, oh, I think this person actually wants to kill that person, you've kind of got to take some steps and do some shit. But, you know, so it's easier to just, oh, he must be just joking, and, you know, so it's it's a defense mechanism, I think, to, to so that you are you don't have to uh, panic. I guess so. Yeah. Dr. Another Scott. defense mechanism would to be to leave the person who's clearly cuckoo bird. Yeah, but that's, if that same person is also is, is threatening people's lives. I guess. You know, like it's, uh, yeah. Then Saskatchewan Premier Grant Devine and Colin Thatcher were at odds. As well, the public had problems with Colin's performance in his position. Colin angrily resigned from his post in the cabinet on January 17th, 1983. I think you could probably apply that first bit of that sentence to everything. Like if if Colin's going shopping, Colin angrily goes shopping. If <laughs> yeah. Colin took a shower, Colin angrily took a shower. So we'll take a break here, and when we come back, we'll be talking about January twenty first, nineteen eighty three. Just four days later. Wow. Okay. On Friday, January 21st, 1983, Joanne drove into her garage at the side of her house at 2876 Albert Street in Regina and got out of her car. The automatic garage lights didn't come on. Joanne was grabbed roughly by an assailant who, while holding her by the throat with his left hand, began raining down blows with a sharp object, slicing and stabbing deep into her head. Joanne whimpered and screamed as the attack ensued. No one inside the house heard her. The 22-year-old housekeeper was making dinner. Seven-year-old Stephanie was watching TV and Joanne's husband Tony was in bed with the flu. Joanne was bludgeoned no fewer than 47 times, then shot behind the right ear which ended the attack. She'd been hit in the head at least 22 times opening large gashes. Joanne's hands were battered and cut due to defensive wounds. She'd reflexively thrown up her hands to protect herself from the brutal attack. Her left arm was broken by the force of the blows and her left pinky was nearly severed. The bones in the palm of her right hand were broken as well. Although the murder weapon was never found, it is believed that it may have been a sharpened meat cleaver. A neighbor Craig Dotson was walking home from work when he heard strange noises coming from the Wilson's garage. He walked past the house but turned around as the sounds got louder. There was a loud pop and then he saw a man walking away. He didn't connect the two until he walked over to the garage and saw Joanne's body lying on the floor. He ran back out to try and spot the man again but there was no sign of him. He then alerted the Wilson household and the police were called. Before the police arrived, Tony had leapt from his bed and in shock knelt near the body of his wife of only two years. The police arrived and secured the crime scene. On top of a snowbank, just near the garage, the police discovered a credit card slip from a gas station. The credit card number and signature on the slip were Colin Thatcher's. The coroner who performed the autopsy said that it is unlikely she would have survived the bludgeoning, even if she had not been shot. Whew, that's uh, hella brutal. Right? Jeez. So that doesn't sound like a hitman. No, there's something personal there. The hitman would have just used the gun. Come up and bang and taken off when there's extreme violence 
like beforehand, that. that's that's a something, personal attack. That, there's something very personal absolutely. there. Absolutely. The the next day after Joanne's murder, Stephanie was sent to a friend's house down the street as her home was crawling with police officers. While she was playing in her friend's room, Colin showed up unannounced with his lawyer, Tony Merchant, son Greg, Sandra Hammond, and Lyle Stewart, a political ally of Collins. Hmm. They entered the house by the patio doors, which were not locked. The mother of Stephanie's friend, Susan Coley, refused to let Colin through to the bedroom where the girls were playing. But he pushed through, grabbed Stephanie, and then they just wrenched the kid away. Yeah, I can imagine the family's got a probably a strong inclination as to who they feel did it at that point in time, thus the kind of wanting him to not just barge in and take them. Stephanie was clinging for dear life to Susan and did not want to go with her father. Mm-hmm. Susan had to let go when Greg got too physical with Stephanie, and the girl was taken by her father out into the cold with no boots or winter coat on. Like, holy shit, isn't it enough that you just you, your mom was just killed? Yeah. And and then you're, there's li- literally a tug of war with you. Yeah. Like, oh, talk about not caring about the kid. From a Canadian tragedy, not only did Susan suffer with sore wrists, elbows, and neck for days after the confrontation, but the week that followed, she had three flat tires after not having one flat tire for over six oh, years. wow. And the fact that she was that sore is good. We, it makes it very clear that it wasn't just some kind of like shove out of my way. Like, no, it it was pretty violent. Her phone rang late at night, too, with nobody on the other end. Joanne's lawyer, Jerry Garand, was contacted by Tony Wilson about the abduction of Stephanie. Hmm. Later that evening, Colin was arrested on abduction charges and Stephanie was returned to Tony Wilson. Oh, that's good. But again, just like what this poor child is having to go through in such a short span here is just, ugh. Well, eventually Tony Wilson gave up fighting for custody of Stephanie after Joanne's murder, as the courts will almost always award custody to the surviving parent. Especially a a political uh, celebrity, shall we say. Uh, Tony was supposed to have visiting rights, but Colin disobeyed this order and and wouldn't let Tony see Stephanie again. Yeah, I'm not surprised by that. On Thursday, January 27th, 1983, this is just six days later, Colin flew to Palm Springs and spent some time with Lynn Daly. According to Lynn from the book A Canadian Tragedy, when Colin walked into the condo, she, quote, shook her head and said, well, you really did it, didn't you? End quote. Hmm. Colin scowled and pointed at the walls and ceiling. He was paranoid about them being bugged, but he nodded yes. Wow. So, uh, yeah, when your girlfriend first words to you are like... So you did you it. You did it, eh? Like, if... And you... <laughs> Then you're pointing at the walls and you go, yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, jeez. Right from the start, investigators thought that Colin had probably committed the crime in person, but it took a long time to prove it. Yeah. Detectives worked tirelessly interviewing friends and neighbors. Some neighbors had seen a certain car parked for three or four nights in a row, and one of them got a partial license plate number, which ended up matching a car that had been signed out by Thatcher from the Central Vehicle Agency of the Saskatchewan government. So oh, he was wow. using government vehicles to yeah. stalk his wife. Uh, just complete arrogance and, and, and confidence, like, pff, I do what I want to do. Some of the tips and clues they worked on included picking up Gary Anderson for questioning and also pondering the long-distance phone call records between Collins' home and the condo in Palm Springs. This led them to Lynn Daly, the part-time girlfriend of Collins. Mm -hmm. They interviewed her, and she clammed up during that first talk. Cops would talk to her a number of times, but it wasn't until much later that she told police Colin had admitted he shot Joanne in the shoulder and then murdered her. She also later told them about the gun Colin had bought in Palm Springs in the summer of 82. Hmm. But again, you know, to give part-time girlfriend some, some support, if you are aware that your partner just murdered somebody... That is incentive to want to keep quiet, because well, you, you know what the person's capable of. So yeah, I'm, she started talking, but no. So I so, saw. So it's pretty pretty awesome that she uh, started talking to the police. Regina investigators came across Blaine Matheson, who had been the boyfriend of Sandra Hammond for about two years until he went off to university. Hmm. Sandra Hammond babysat and did housekeeping for Colin. She was known to do everything in her power to prevent Joanne from seeing the children. Hmm. She also referred to Joanne as the bitch in front of the kids and everyone else. Blaine had spent a lot of time in Colin's house and had gone on a winter holiday with Colin, Sandra, and the children to Palm Springs in Arizona. 
Blaine had been drawn into the affairs of Colin. Uh, when Blaine was questioned by police after the murder, he said that Sandra had told him that Thatcher had agreed to have a hitman come up from the U.S. to kill Joanne. He also shared that he'd seen a rifle in a rented car parked in Thatcher's garage before the first shooting. Hmm. This led police to the discovery that Gary Anderson had rented the car and was the first real piece of evidence that there was a relationship between Gary and Colin. Hmm. The police had suspected Gary of being involved. After much back and forth between the police and Gary, they finally made an agreement with him to tell the truth about what happened. If he didn't tell the truth, he'd be charged with murder, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so cooperate and, and maybe we'll lessen the charge. Yep. So Anderson's talking, so Colin's hooped because Anderson knows everything. Oh, yeah, once once he starts talking. Yeah. Toodaloo, Colin. Fifteen months after the murder, the police and prosecutors met to go over the evidence and decide to charge what to charge Colin with. They all felt it was a little thin for first-degree murder, but they all believed that that's what he'd committed. Mm -hmm. They decided to see if they could get a recording of Colin talking about the situation. Oh. So they approached Gary Anderson. Gary was the best person for the job, and he decided that he would go ahead and wear a wire and have a conversation with Colin. Mm -hmm. On May 1st, 1984, Colin met up with Gary at an abandoned farm where they had this talk. From court documents, the two start talking about having gotten rid of evidence from the recent crime, and Thatcher alludes to the earlier attempt on Joanne's life expressing concerns that police may find something from that. Mm. And if that weren't enough, uh, the exchange kind of ends like this. Thatcher says, Okay, and just remember there are no er problems, and uh, there won't be unless they trip over something, and I got no intention of giving them anything to trip on. And Anderson says, K. And Thatcher says, there's no loose ends, like, you know, there's nothing for them to find, you know? And Anderson says, it's all been... And Thatcher interrupts all. And Anderson finishes, taken care of. And then Thatcher says, sure, heavens yes, heavens yes, I'm, uh... But I still don't trust the bastards for bugs. Mean... I don't know whether there's any possibility that's why when we talk, uh, just assume the bastards are listening. Well, they were. <laughs> they were listening, uh, because your friend who you're talking to about bugs is bugged. Is, is bugged. Yeah. You, you were bugged. <laughs> this gave the final piece of evidence that was needed to arrest Colin Thatcher and charge him with first degree murder. Two police officers and a crown prosecutor, Serge Kujawa, then flew to Palm Springs because they knew they had to convince Lynn Daly to be a witness, and she eventually agreed. Yep, yeah, well, again, talking about when things start to spiral, you know, at this point, you either cooperate with us or you go to the pokey for, mm -hmm. you know, a witness, uh, or uh, Colin a baiting and an ed abetting. Aiding you know, and abetting? Something, yeah. I don't know. She'll get charged with something. Yep. Colin was arrested and thrown in the Who's Gal. Oh, the old oh. Who's Gal. Yeah, the old Who's Gal. Not the new Who's Gal. No, the old one. Yeah, it's better. An important legal question that had to be decided before the trial began was, it was Thatcher who did unlawfully cause the death of Joanne K. Wilson and thereby commit first-degree murder contrary to Section 218 of the Criminal Code. The operative words were cause of death. They meant that Thatcher could be found guilty regardless of whether he had committed the crime personally or had persuaded someone else to do it. Yeah. So either way, he would be guilty of yes. murder. Yes. Yeah. Because it, it, without him, without either party, it wouldn't have happened. So he's, yeah. he's absolutely responsible. Here's some audio from the Global News Archives about that first day of Colin Thatcher's trial. Colin Thatcher arrived at the Saskatoon courthouse in an RCMP cruiser, handcuffed for the beginning of his first-degree murder trial. The former Saskatchewan Energy Minister is charged in connection with the brutal 1983 slaying of his ex-wife, Joanne Wilson, in the garage of her Regina home. Addressing a five-woman, seven-man jury, Chief Crown Prosecutor Serg Kuyava said he will present evidence that Thatcher attempted to hire a farm neighbor to kill his former wife. Kuyava claims the neighbor refused, but did supply guns, ammunition, and cars. The prosecution also maintains Thatcher admitted to a former girlfriend after the murder that he killed his ex-wife. The first witness, Regina Police Constable Brian Frickland, testified a credit card receipt from a Karen Saskatchewan service station was found at the murder scene. It had Colin Thatcher's signature, but Thatcher's fingerprints could not be found on it. 
A passerby, Craig Dotson, testified he was attracted to the Wilson garage by screams, only to find Mrs. Wilson's body and a bearded, long-haired man leaving the scene. During the course of the trial, the Crown is expected to present a tape recording of a conversation made between Colin Thatcher and the man alleged to have helped arrange the murder. Colin Thatcher's former girlfriend, to whom Thatcher is alleged to have admitted killing Joanne Wilson, is also expected to testify. The first two days of the trial had several eyewitnesses and police officers give testimony. Several people had been seen sitting in a car in an alley behind the Wilson house, with the engine not running, but someone sitting inside. As it was January in Saskatchewan, it struck the witnesses as unusual. They said it would be a bit chilly. Craig Dotson had only a quick glimpse of the man walking away from the garage, and it was dark out. Mm -hmm. And of course, the defense lawyer hammered away at him for the sketch that looked nothing like Colin Thatcher, mm -hmm. which was produced shortly after the murder. But we all know eyewitnesses are usually not the best witnesses. Yeah, yeah, especially uh, descriptions of what they see are surprisingly inaccurate. Well, it was a bit rough for the prosecution because, mm -hmm. you know, they mm -hmm. banged away at it that way. It is a hole that they can poke. Colin's lawyers worked over prosecution witnesses. Lynn Daly proved to be an articulate and candid witness. The whole province of Saskatchewan, indeed Canada, was now following this trial. For some of them, the comment Colin made to Lynn after the murder was all they needed to conclude that he was guilty. That comment was, it's a strange feeling to blow your wife away. Holy shit, yeah. Um, so that's hearsay. I mean, she's saying that's what he said. But, that, but you know, uh, a juror, that will resonate with them because that's... <laughs> what did he say to you? He said it's a strange feeling to blow your wife away. Oh, okay. So that's, that's very helpful. Yeah. That will resonate. The jury will like, oh. Oh, there's more. Oh, is there? Gary Anderson took the stand on Monday and Tuesday of the second week of the trial. Crown Prosecutor Serge Kujawa led his witness through the history of his relationship with Colin Thatcher beginning in the fall of 1980. Gary explained the meetings with Charlie Wilde, a so-called hitman, mm -hmm. the passing of money from Colin Thatcher to Gary, providing Colin Thatcher with a, a car three times, the visual inspections of the Wilson home and alley, the 357 used in the murder, and the final cleanup. Okay. When it came time for the prosecution to introduce the tape of Anderson and Thatcher, Collins' lawyers objected. So the jury was excused while lawyers and judge decided whether or not the taped evidence could be used. In the end, it was accepted into evidence. Phew, good. Uh, when asked later, the audience in the courtroom would not describe this conversation as innocent discussion between two law-abiding citizens. Oh, uh, the entire transcript of the taped conversation is available in numerous books on the case. So if you want to look it up, you can. It's it's definitely findable. Yeah. It's, it's kind of boring, Yeah, I would, I would imagine so. A lot of discussion for a little bit. All three of Colin and Joanne's children attended the trial every day, including 10-year-old Stephanie and Colin's mother, Peggy. Hmm. I can't imagine the effect on the children hearing... You know, okay, even the sons who are so in their father's camp, hearing your dad is a murderer, your dad is a murderer, your dad is a murderer. There's no way it doesn't mess you up. Because even if you are still on your father's side yeah. and, and believing that he's innocent and that this is just a conspiracy or he's being framed, like that's the, to have to be a, a young individual yeah. and dealing with did my father kill my mother? Like, yeah. that's going to just, that'll screw you up. Especially right at there. 10. You're you're 10 years old and you have to have to hear this and sort oh. of, like, absorb all that information about your parents. And... Oh, and poor Stephanie, being in the house when she was killed, having been torn from uh, people yeah. in the house the next day. Like, yeah. oh, at such a young age. Yeah. Oh. The last Crown witness, Charlie Wilde, relayed the story of meeting Gary Anderson, who approached Charlie about committing murder. Charlie, a man with criminal convictions all related to drugs, and another friend of his pretty much milked Colin for thousands of dollars. Hmm. They had no intention of murdering anyone, but saw this as an opportunity to make some easy money. So that, that happens all the time. Yeah, it's, it, we hear it quite often. Yeah, what are you going to do? So I, you so, know, yeah. Oh, I'm going to go to the police and tell them that you uh, took my money. Yeah, well, yeah, no, you're not. Because, you know, oh, well, what, what was the money given to them for? Well, I was, I was asking them to kill my wife, but, you know. 
Charlie stood up well on the witness stand and the defense lawyer was unable to get any comments from Charlie that would help Collins' defense. At this point, Serge Kujawa announced, That's the case for the Crown, my lord. Mm, well. So, on Thursday, October 25th, the defense began calling their witnesses to refute the prosecution's case. That's what they're supposed to do. Correct. Experts, character witnesses, and those providing alibis would, in their words, show Colin Thatcher not guilty. Oh, totes. Yeah, totes not guilty. Dramatically, both Colin and Joanne's sons, Reagan and Greg, had provided alibis for their father for both shootings. Oh. Prosecutor Serge Kajawas was able to poke holes in their testimony. Yeah, you shouldn't have to be that young and testifying in the case uh, of a parent being murdered. Like, I, just a, well, I think I think Greg at the time would have been in twenty twenty, you know. Yeah, it's still though. Uh, if your parent passes away from cancer or a car accident, that is difficult enough to process. Let alone one parent had killed the other. Yeah, and you're kind of being caught in the middle of picking here. On on a, on the stand, like, oh, yeah, for sure. More witnesses took the stand to give testimony about having seen or spoken to Colin Thatcher during the time he was supposed to have been committing murder. Some of these people received phone calls from Colin, Greg, Tony Merchant, and Gary Albright, Colin's lawyer, mm -hmm. just before their affidavit to refresh their memories. Quote, mm -hmm. this called the timing of when Colin was at home eating dinner into question, so the timelines were a little off. Mm -hmm. Gary Albright, Thatcher's defense attorney, put Colin on the stand. Mm -hmm. Albright led Thatcher through a glowing history of the Thatcher family and their successes in the business and political world. Ooh, okay, I'm still like you know, putting Colin on the stand. Like, we hear all the time. Don't do it. Don't do it. So The second topic was the marriage. Colin once again described in mostly glowing terms how it had been wonderful for most of the 17 years. Then he comments that Joanne was going through, oh, justice syndrome, whatever they call it, when somebody approached 40. Uh, aging? Is that the syndrome? Wait, what? Menopause doesn't usually happen until, like, 50, right? I I'm assuming he's, like, implying midlife crisis or, or depression something. or something like that, but, uh Whatever. Yeah. Who cares? So her fault, essentially, is yeah, what he's, he's saying. Blaming her. It's her fault. He goes on to say he wanted to help her. He tried to behave better. Uh, he knew that he had fallen short over the years. Well, there you go. He's a little contrite now mm, when it's convenient. Yeah, exactly. She packed up the two youngest and left him when he went away. Yeah. What a shame. Yeah. No, I mean... Uh, it's all, all her fault. All her fault? Or that was the only time she felt safe to leave the prick. Exactly. Albright then questioned Colin about the tape-recorded conversation with Gary Anderson. Colin explained everything away, saying it was cowboy slang, or he didn't even know what Gary was talking about, but he agreed with him anyway. Cowboy slang. Cowboy slang. Mm, interesting. Y'all. Y'all. Serge Kajawa wanted to get Colin Thatcher, quote, roaring mad during the cross-examination. He succeeded early on. And this show of anger was a good thing for the jury, press, and the audience to witness. Yeah, this is why you don't let the defendant take the stand, especially in, in a, a case like this, because where... clearly they've got anger issues. But I guarantee you it was Colin who was saying to his lawyers, no, I need to take this. They will see, because he's used to being sure. able to smooth talk Because he's a narcissist. Yeah, and he thinks so. But you know, wow, so he showed that he was, uh, he showed some anger, did he? Serge aggressively questioned Colin about the alibis his family and friends had provided, the fact that the marriage was not nearly as good as Colin stated, and hammered away on the tapes that Gary Anderson had made. <laughs> Finally, Serge attacked Colin by having him admit, on the night of Joanne's murder, when he knew his daughter Stephanie was with her mom, he did not call the Wilson residence to see if she was okay. Oh, so he got him to admit that, so... Yeah. Yeah. So you didn't even call to see if your daughter's okay Holy after, your shit. Wife's, after your ex-wife was murdered. But yet the next day you come storming in and kidnap her, but you don't call the night it happened. Sweetheart, my daughter, my love, are you okay? Are you okay? Is there anything you need? I heard the most horrible thing happened. Yeah. What What can daddy do for you? Yeah. No. Nope. Nope. Interesting. Yeah. A surprise witness more or less fell into Kajawa's hands. It was none other than Dick Culver. He was a former leader of the Saskatchewan Conservative Party and longtime family friend of the Thatchers. Oh, okay. 
He was living in Arizona, but happened to be in Saskatoon visiting his daughter while the trial was on. Hmm. And he had some things that he was able to say about Colin. Oh. He was also the friend that Colin, with family in tow, had visited between Christmas and New Year's in 1979. He was the friend who Colin repeatedly told that he needed to hire someone to kill the bitch. Oh, okay. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Dick had become so sick of his behavior that he asked Colin to leave. Given the potential impact of Dick's testimony, Kajawa asked for the Crown's case to be reopened, and it was. Mm -hmm. So Dick Culver took the stand, and his testimony is all relayed in the book A Canadian Tragedy. Uh, the highlight was, of course, when Dick explained how Colin had at least three times asked Dick if he knew anyone who could kill Joanne. <sighs> this is where that kind of stupidity comes back to bite you in the ass. Bite you in the stupid. <laughs> bite, you, bite you right in the stupid. <laughs> After 18 full days of testimony, closing arguments were given and the jury was sequestered until they reached a verdict. They spent three days deliberating, returning to the court for clarification on a few items on the in the interim. However, on Tuesday, November 6th, the verdict was reached. Let's let this audio from the Global News Archives tell you what the jury's decision was. Colin Thatcher has been found guilty of first-degree murder in the January 1983 killing of Joanne Wilson, his former wife, with whom he went through a bitter separation, divorce, and child custody battle, which began in 1979 and ended with her death four years after. Mr. Justice J.H. Maher sentenced Thatcher to the mandatory life imprisonment. He will not be eligible for parole for 25 years. The sentence will likely be served not in Saskatchewan, but in some other penitentiary because Prince Albert is a dangerous maximum security institution. Police officials say he will not be going to the penitentiary immediately. He will be held in custody in either Regina or this city for 30 days so that an appeal can be lodged with the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal. That this is always a tragic waste of a human life. And it seems to be magnified when you have a man with so much talent and ability. Colin Thatcher was led away in front of reporters who continued to ask him questions. Colin, are you going to appeal? Are you going to appeal, Colin? No, I'm not going to It doesn't matter now. It doesn't matter? Have you given up, Colin? Sure. I am innocent. I did not do it. But it wasn't in the cards, and no, I will not do it. Did you get a fair trial, Mr. Thatcher? I'm innocent, so I don't know what to do. Mr. Thatcher, how is your relationship with God going to... What a media circus. Prosecutor Serge Kajawa finished a statement to reporters saying, What you have to understand about Colin Thatcher is that he isn't crazy, he's evil. Oh, fuck, I love that. That's a really, really good quote. Thatcher's lawyer filed an appeal, which was denied. Colin went to a federal penitentiary in Edmonton, where he continued on with some of his interests, including preaching to other prisoners about being a born-again Christian. Oh, God. Because that's convenient now. Yeah, yeah. He received conjugal visits from his girlfriend at the time of the trial. He wrote a book on politics in Saskatchewan. His three children continued to live in their family, continued to live in their family home in Moose Jaw, with the two younger, uh, with the younger two continuing their studies, and Greg running the ranch. Peggy was very involved with the children, as was Gary Albright and his wife. Colin applied for early parole in late 1999. This hearing provided an opportunity for Joanne's family to express themselves and gave a voice to the silent victim, Joanne. Huh. They spoke about the division in the family that occurred right after the murder. Mm -hmm. No longer were the children to see or play with their cousins. One set of grandparents had lost three grandchildren. Oh, yeah. Joanne's siblings were afraid that Colin might show up at the door with a gun. This application for parole was turned down. Thank God. Several more attempts were made over the years, with Thatcher being granted partial, then full parole in 2006. So he's out and about. Yeah, well, this all happened. I was pretty young when it happened, but I remember a lot of it from the parole hearing and him getting out. That was quite the uh, uproar. Colin Thatcher married again. 
in 1994 while in prison. He married a woman named Bev Shaw, who started visiting him in jail after she saw the TV movie made about his story. I'll never understand that. I'll, I'll never understand how people... Colin so. Thatcher was played by Donnelly Rhodes in that. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I don't get that. Like The whole fault... Yeah. Chasing Ted Bundy or Danny Rowling or somebody. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of people in prison Rich who were there for, for fairly... Uh, yeah. I hate saying innocuous, but you know, like possession of marijuana. Oh, sure, fall in love with them, marry them. Yeah. But uh, a murder, a convicted murderer. Like, yeah. what do you, how do you think that's going to go? It's pretty bazonkers. Yeah. Oh, well, whatever. Thatcher wrote a book about this case entitled Final Appeal Anatomy of a Frame. Oh, fuck off. Even the title pisses me off. Anatomy of a Frame. Mm uh hmm. -huh. So, not my fault. He was immediately taken to task over profiting from his crimes. Yes. Here's some audio from Global News talking about the outcome of that case. No, I have no comment. It appears Colin Thatcher will not get the last word after all. A judge ruling yesterday the convicted killer cannot profit from his novel, and now comes word the author has had enough. Colin Thatcher, the man behind the 380-page novel, is now choosing his words very carefully. Global News reached his publishing company today, and they say he's not speaking at this time. He was basically fed up with courts and hearings and judgments, and he didn't want to proceed. Who is speaking up, however, is his publisher, saying the ruling violates Thatcher's basic rights. If you deprive someone of the royalties from legitimately writing a book, then it acts as a deterrent for anyone else who might think about writing a book. But not everyone is upset over the ruling. This longtime women's counselor hopes this will stop books like this from going to print. I think it's important for people to realize that when someone commits a crime that they're not going to profit from it later on, and I think that's very important for people to hear. At this bookstore, the novel's controversial origins aren't slowing sales. The response was very good when it first came out. It's uh, slowed down a bit now, but at Christmas it was a huge seller. We didn't even have stock of it at Christmas. Readers also aren't quite ready to write off Thatcher just yet. Well, I just feel like any human being, if they have served their crime and they have... Uh, reconciled and um, and done their time that they should be able to like you would expect them to make money if they get a job so what if you write in the prison aren't those words your own anyway and why should someone be able to steal your words and your profits an estimated 8,000 in profits that will now have to be repaid to the province Amanda Ferguson Global News they had turned over as much as $14,000 in profits from the book to groups helping people affected by domestic violence and assisting survivors of homicide. Well, that's good. Way to go, Saskatchewan. So that, dear listeners, is the story, The Murder of Joanne Wilson by Colin Thatcher. <sighs> yeah, I don't... Uh, uh, a complete narcissist. Clear-cut case of narcissism here. It, just... Knowing and hearing that he's caused so much damage that it's all on him. He's the one who has done this, but yet accepts no accountability in it and blames others. Like, just a, just a piece of work. A real piece of work. Yeah. Yeah, and, and he's out. He's out. Yeah, Colin Thatcher, he's out. He's out and about. He's out and about. All right. So before we go... Uh, we want to thank uh, some Patreon patrons for their patronage. Yes, we do. I said patron a lot. You did. Uh, first up, Lacey Oliver from Lumby, BC. We we see Lacey a lot in the Umber Yard. Thank you, Lacey. Yes, Lacey. Thank you. You are totes, my goats. Awesome sauce. All of those things. All of those things. Yeah. Uh, Keely O'Brien, and she's from Castle Rock, Colorado. Sweet, hey. Not Castle Rock, uh, Maine, where oh, a lot of the Stephen King yeah, stories Yeah, I was take excited place. there, but hey, thanks, Keely. Next up, Lucas Gustafson. Hey, Lucas. Ooh, where's Lucas from? So uh, he he's from, uh, oh, where was it? Uh, not Denmark. Uh, I believe it's Sweden. He is the brother of UFC fighter, you know, Gustafson. Okay. Yeah, he's a, sure. he's a UFC fighter. This is his brother. He fought John Jones uh, mul multiple times. Some people think he won the fight against John Jones. Anyway, so this is his brother. He's his main training partner. Yeah. And just one uh, top-notch athlete. So, uh, Lucas, 
Thanks for joining. Give my sh- give some uh, m- give my respect to your brother. Well, there you go. Yeah, Christine Cassis uh, from Bellevue, hey? Nebraska. Oh wait, is it Bellevue in Nebraska? Yeah. I, yeah. Okay, I thought it was the one Good. in Washington, but wow. It's okay, not. there's a multiple. There's multi Bellevues, but uh, yeah. thanks, Christine. Uh, if any is Nebraska, it is. NV is Nevada. So. Well, any is not Washington, so well, no matter what, it's, no matter what, is multiple. Lauren, Mary Ellen Hyde from North Saanich, BC. Oh. And every time I hear, the, I know people have probably said this a million times. Nope, never. Every time I hear the, the word Saanich, I think I want a sandwich. Yep, yep. Sandwich. Sandwich. Yep. Nope, that's the first time that joke's ever been made. Uh, Betsy Michelle Wells. Oh, hey, Betsy. From Burbank, Washington. Oh. Burbank, Washington. Why does it say Washington? I thought Burbank was in California. Well, I guess well, it's in Washington. Yeah, we're learning a lot about geography today. And then people Thanks, correct Patsy. me, but I don't know. Like, it's that what says it, WA. It's what it says here. Okay. Jeremy Thomas. Thank you, Jeremy. Hey, Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, I think Jeremy Thomas yeah. is uh, actually, he lives in Antarctica. Oh, wow. And he's, he's actually uh, into penguin husbandry. Oh, oh! Explain penguin penguin husbandry. This sounds like a fascinating. So essentially, what a what a somebody who's into penguin husbandry does. You marry penguins? No, no. Oh. You help penguins to breed. Oh. So he he takes care of them, takes care of breeding pairs of penguins. Okay. And ensures that they uh, don't wander off into the nothingness well, that and, is, and die. That is really noble, Jeremy. Yeah. Great work awesome. out there you're doing, Christy Arellano. Yeah. And she's from New West. Hey, Christy, my my stomping, you're, you're grounds. stomping grounds. Yeah, yeah. Savannah Murray, and she's from Jacksonville, Florida. Hey, Savannah, Jacksonville. Jacksonville. Uh, Lawton Melmoth from Twickenham in England. Wow, I think England has some of the best names. I know. Of, of places. Yeah, Twickenham. I, I quite like that. Yeah, Twickenham. Da- Danny Jordan, he's from Springtown, Texas. Hey, Danny. Thanks. Thanks, bud. Or, and then there's yeah. just plain old Amanda. Yeah, yeah. She's from Mundelein, Illinois. Mund- Mundelein. Yeah. Okay, well. Mundelein, Illinois. Hey, Amanda, thank you. Melissa Harding. She's from Sound Beach, New York. Okay. Linda Hill is from Clearwater, <gasps> B.C. Wait a minute here. Who was born in Clearwater, B.C.? Wait a minute here. That's where I was born. That is where you were born. Linda Hill? Did you, yeah. Do you know Linda? Oh, do I ever not? No, I don't think don't we, I don't think her. we've ever met. I don't think we have. But wow, that is so cool. Like that's a, it's a small town, y'all. Anybody listening out there? Clearwater is not like some roaring hustle and bustle metropolis. So right on, Linda. Uh, Armin Man. Armin Man. So Armin Man. Yep. That sounds like a like uh, a superhero. That's exactly what I was thinking, and you know why it does? Why? Because it is. Wow, thanks. Yeah. That's our first superhero. It is our first superhero, and man, are we honored. Man, we, are we honored. We appreciate Our man, it. are we honored. Armin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah like, it's his power, superpower isn't one that most people uh, would think of, and boy, it could really be used for bad. He, he can, his superpower is, he, he, he can know your PIN number. Yep. On your bank account? Oh, no. Yeah, without even having, yeah, having there's to. There's nothing in there anyway. Yeah. It, it, that can be, well, I, exa- you put some money in, and then you can take Oh, it he puts money in. Yeah, he, that's but that's that's his. That's nice. Yeah, yeah. That's a nice And then superpower. you can take it out. It's just, it's really, he's, he, he, and that's why he's my favorite. Well, there you have yeah, it. Yeah, Armin, man. Uh, Tanya Noreen, or Tanya, I'm not sure here, because sometimes it's either either or. Yeah, it's, it's tough to know, but. Uh, and she is from Clayfield. In Queensland, Australia. Oh, right on. Shouldn't I thank you, nice lady? Yeah. Uh, Lauren Wrencher from Orem, Utah. Man, we're getting a lot of uh, American and international people. Yeah, here. we're pretty happy with that. Yeah, I'm, totally. And you know what? I would love to go to Utah. I love the, the desert and all that kind of yes, stuff. Yes, yes, I hear you. I really want to yeah. see that part of the world. I'd love it too. Eventually, sometime. Yep. Maybe when we... Drive somewhere. I don't know. Uh, and last but not least is Jennifer Gidry, and she's from Winston Salem, North Carolina. Oh, cool! Hey, Jennifer, thank you. Thank you. Thank so you all. Much. Thank you all for your support. Yes, absolutely. Thank you all our patrons, past and present, for your support. 
We appreciate it, yep. and our show is better for it, let me tell you. Yes. You guys have helped us out more than you know. Oh, my God, yes. Yeah. Literally. And kids are kids eat because of it. <laughs> well, and you're helping us grow. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we did get some PayPal money this week, and thank you to Danielle DeJong for uh, sending us some donut money oh. on PayPal. Oh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much. Seriously appreciate it. If you want to help support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. Or for one-time support, you can send us some donut money via PayPal at our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. And if you don't already, it would mean a lot to us if you subscribe to the show. You can easily find us on iTunes Podcast, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever you get your on-demand audio, mm -hmm. like this podcast. Check out our website, darkpoutine.com, for show notes and other cool stuff. Give us a follow or a like on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook if they're working. Just search for Tired Dark Poutine. Give them all, if they're working, yeah, give them all a like. And most importantly, tell your friends word of mouth is a powerful thing. Join yeah. us on our clothes group called the, the Yumber, Yumber Yard. Yard. It's full of good eggs who call themselves Yumber Yard, Yumber Jacks, Yumber Yaks, Yumber Jills. Doesn't matter. Yumber whatever. Yumber yourself. <laughs> yumber you. Go Yumber yourself. But I guess that's it. Ooh, wow. Until next week, Ooh. don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.